So um, this, is, this is my website with my publications and some uh, contact info. Um, I'm working in Belgium for the Royal Belgian Institute for Natural Sciences. This is a government, uh, federal government scientific establishment and I have a little research team there. We're working on remote sensing and ecosystem modeling. Um, I'll give a, a short biography. I was born in the UK on 30th of July 1966. Are there any English people here? Okay, this is, this is a major date in English history. Um, can you tell us why millions of people were on the streets on this day, celebrating? <laughs> Sorry? It was the last time England won a major football competition. Um, I studied maths at Cambridge, graduated in 1987. Um, maths is a really great place to start your career because mathematical tools are really, really useful. It's not much of a life, so um, if you start off in maths, it really gets much more interesting if you go into other topics where the maths is useful but where there's some application that you can relate to, to nature. And in my case, I went into fluid dynamics for a master's in the Mont Carmel Institute, so I moved from the UK to Belgium in 1987. Uh, I, took, I arrived with a rucksack and uh, I arrived for a one year's master's course and I'm still there today. It's a good place to be Belgium. Um, I like Belgium. Um, I did my PhD in oceanography at the University of Liège. This was in computational hydrodynamics. So it was a continuation of the fluid dynamics I was working on. Um, is there anyone here doing hydrodynamics? No, okay. I hope no one's listening on the internet. Um, because I went out of hydrodynamics in 1996 into satellite oceanography. Um, CWIFS was just about to go up and there was some funding in Belgium for, for satellite work. Uh, and that was the best decision of my career because since 1996, nothing's happened in, ocean, in, in hydrodynamics. I go back to the conferences sometime, I sit in and I see that nothing's happened in the last 20 years. They, they've got bit better computers, they're running finer grids, but there's no real new ideas there. Uh, they get very angry with me when I say this, but really, um, it's, it's still the same stuff. Whereas in satellite oceanography, absolutely everything has changed. In fact, every four or five years, everything changes again. Um, and I think that's going to continue. So I think I'd be interested to see what you would say about yourselves in 20 years' time. But I think you'll find that every four or five years, Things are completely changing in satellite oceanography. So it's a really good place to be. Uh, for me, a big date was 2000 uh, when we were getting the first CWIFS data and when NASA put CDAS source code on, on the internet for everyone to use. Um, I'm eternally grateful for NASA for doing that because I learned how to do atmospheric correction by reading the CDAS source code and reading Gordon's papers and Megawell Wang's papers that, that, that explained what was happening there. Um, we got out an atmospheric correction for sea WIFs that was actually working in turbid waters. That was really, really popular for a few years. Uh, people used the code, people cited the publication. Um, people are still citing that publication now. Um, actually, it's quite negative now. People are just citing it to show how much better their own atmospheric <laughs> correction is. But that's, that's part of the game too, and um, it's, it's still nice that people are, are looking at it. Um, 2002, I set up a small team in remote sensing and ecosystem modeling for people. Um, and 2002, Maris and Modis came online, and this was even better than CWIFS because we had all the extra bands to play with, um, particularly uh, in Maris, the Red Edge bands and Modis, um, more bands. Um, 2006, uh, I did a paper using the Trios Radius Ramses field radiometer. This is a hyperspectral radiometer. Really, really good instrument. We bought it in 2001. We're still using it. And we could use that to look at, um, for example, the near infrared reflectance in turbid waters. But then things kept on changing. Um, 2008 to 2010, we started getting into the geostationary ocean color. Um, we looked at Severi. I'll show you some results from that. And then GOSI went up, um, the Koreans launched that, and it was really exciting. 2012, Landsat 8 came along. Um, we had free data from USGS, thank you very much. And it was high quality data as well. It was much less noisy than the previous Landsat. And that was hugely exciting when we first saw that data. But it didn't stop. In 2015, we started looking at Playard data, very high resolution, you'll see some of that tomorrow. Uh, Sentinel-2 came online, and even better than Lancer 8 in a few respects. Um, and Sentinel 3's been launched as well. So 
Um, in, in terms of my career, looking back over it, I've coloured a few things in red that made a major change for me. Can anyone see the link between those, those words, perhaps? Yes? You're nodding. <laughs> It's ocean color satellites, yeah. Um, we're lucky to be in a field where the hardware is developing so fast that every few years there's some really new ways that we can look at the ocean. And these new ways of looking at the ocean mean that there's jobs for researchers to develop all the new algorithms that we'll be needing. I think this will continue. Okay, I'm supposed to show that I'm a real person as well, so I do like cooking, I like watching films, and I like playing football. And I live in Belgium. Does everyone know where Belgium is? Who knows where Belgium is? Well, good, good, good. <laughs> um, actually, 10% of the people in the room live in Belgium. It's quite a small country, but we're all over the place. <laughs> it's here. So, Villefranche is here, Belgium's here. This is where I grew up, this is where I now live. Okay, that was the pre No, this is still the pre-introduction. Um, okay, um, why should you be following this course? Um, a single person with a PC and a good internet connection can do a huge job of processing and providing data for any region in the world. Um, monthly maps, time series, um, suspended matter, chlorophyll. All this can be done by a single person. So whereas for many scientific disciplines you need to have a team, you need to have a lot of equipment, um, in this field, even on your own, you can make a difference. As long as you've got a PC, a fast internet connection, and a knowledge of marine optics and remote sensing, which you will have by the end of these two weeks. So um, I don't know where you all are. I'm going to ask you in a minute where you all are. But it doesn't matter where you are. On your own, you can really make a difference. And you can provide data to colleagues where there's no in-situ data at all. And you can do this going back to 2002 or even back to 1997 with CWIFs. So if you're sufficiently experienced, in a couple of days, you can put together a 20-year time series of, of these products and you can share that with fisheries scientists or uh, marine biologists or, or other colleagues. On your own, you can make a difference. So this is a CWIFs chlorophyll composite uh, for the first year of the mission, version one processing, where uh, if you forget the land, colours. I, I, I don't know what the land colours are, it's probably vegetation index. But for the, for the water areas, the red means high chlorophyll A, or perhaps not. And there's a few question marks we have over the chlorophyll in the North Sea, in the Baltic, in the La Plata estuary, uh, the Amazon plume, um, the Arabian Sea, and the Yellow Sea and the, the Yang Si Cheng Yang plume, uh, where this is probably completely wrong. Do you see what these areas might have in common? Coastal areas. Sorry? Coastal areas. Yeah, it's coastal areas. More than that, it's turbid water areas in general. The Baltic is a bit of an exception. That's a high sea dom area. But if you look at, for example, the La Plata plume, the Amazon plume, the Yang Si plume and the Yellow Sea plume, these are turbid waters where the standard chlorophyll product is completely wrong because of things that we're going to explain in these lectures. So there's two basic problems in turbid waters. One is the atmospheric correction, which Cedric dealt with. And the second problem is the chlorophyll retrieval in regions where there's high non-algae particle absorption. That's something that you'll be um, looking at in a little Excel-based computer exercise that you'll be doing in about 45 minutes' time. But I'll give a few lectures first. So I've been asked to talk on ocean colour remote sensing in turbid waters. Um, this is the introductory lecture where I'm going to talk mainly about chlorophyll retrieval and total suspended matter retrieval, TSM. Um, I've stolen results from um, many researchers, but most of them uh, are ones that have passed through my team at some stage or my projects. Um, I must say I, had, I do have a problem with the title of the talk. Because it's certainly true that the oceanographers have driven progress in algorithm work in aquatic optics. But I think it's much broader than oceanography now. And ocean color radiometry, um, it's very, very important still. It's important for the 
for the open oceans and the global carbon cycle, but there's lots and lots of applications now in coastal and inland waters. So uh, if it's at all possible to rename the IOCCG at some stage, um, I think it would be nice to take account of all these new applications that are arriving in the coastal waters and the inland waters. I'll show you some of those during the lectures. I'll give an overview of the lectures so you know when you can relax a little bit. Um, well, the scope, it's issues specific to turbid waters. So it's especially chlorophyll and total suspended matter retrieval in turbid waters. The atmospheric correction you've seen this morning in theory from, Le from Cedric. Um, I'll also talk about some new parameters and applications um, in the turbid waters. I assume that you have a basic knowledge of absorption, scattering and reflectance. Is this true? Yes. People are nodding. <laughs> so the guys last week, they did a good job. Thank you. Um, and I hope you have some basic knowledge of ocean colour algorithms as well. I think that Zongping and Colin talked about this a bit last week, so um, it's nice for me to come in later when, when you have this background information. In terms of the organisation, this is lecture one. There will be lecture two. Well, lecture two is really an introduction to the uh, Excel-based exercise that you're going to be, going to be doing at three o'clock for half an hour um, on your computers. And then there's a coffee break, and then at four o'clock I hand over to Quentin, who will give an introduction to Acolyte and the atmospheric correction it uses, and we'll get you started on processing the Lancer 8 and Sentinel-2 imagery that you downloaded last week, uh, last night. Uh, who, who has downloaded their imagery? Good, good. I really hope so, because if you haven't, it, take, it can take 10 to 20 to 30 minutes to download it. If you all start doing it now, you'll probably bring down the LOV network. So I really hope that you've done that. If you haven't done it, please download it during the coffee break because it'll be useful when you start processing the imagery to have the imagery already on your disk. And then tomorrow we have another sec uh, section session where Quentin will give a short lecture, I think, on high resolution imagery and applications. And then you will present the results of the imagery that you've processed this afternoon. So we'll have a, some, it'll need to be quite fast, but maybe you'll get one or two minutes each to present the image that you've processed and tell us what you see, what you see there and whether you've noticed any processing problems or any new things um, that you didn't know were happening in your region. Um, so yeah, you're going to be working quite hard. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll wrap up at about 10 o'clock with a lecture on summary and future perspectives for turbid water remote sensing. OK, um, this is lecture one. Uh, what are turbid waters? Well, if you look in Wikipedia, they say that turbidity is the cloudiness or haziness of a fluid ca caused by individual particles. So you can have particles in a gas, like aerosols in air or smoke in air, and you can have particles in water, um, the algae particles and non-algae particles that we're most interested in. Um, there's a rather more scientific definition provided by the International Standards Organization um, where they provide a measurement um, to define turbidity. Um, it's the measurement at 90 degrees of scattering at wavelength 860 nanometers relative to formazin. So um, this is a fairly precise definition of what turbidity is. Measuring turbidity relative to formazin, this is not not appreciated by some optical oceanographers where we would prefer uh, units in SI uh, system, for example, meters minus one. It is possible to convert from formers into meters minus one. Um, and this can be measured by this kind of instrument. I've got one with me. If you want to take a look at it in the, in the coffee break. Oops. So it's... Um, I don't think we have time to use it, but it's a simple instrument where you put a, a water sample in here, you close it, you press the button, it tells you the stability. And I've got the calibration, the calibration vials with me. It's quite an easy instrument to use, and the calibration be, can be checked quite easily. These are vials of water with different, um, different turbidities. Actually, I'll pass that one round. Um, so. You can look at one or two of these. I'll just shake them up a bit. There's a 
protocol for shaking them up, which I don't have time to do. So I'll pass that around and maybe you take it out. You just, top, just touch the top, please. Don't touch the glass because that will, that will need to be cleaned afterwards. Just take it out, look at it. This is stability. Put it back in. So this is stability. Um, there's been a lot of problems with the measurement of stability in the past because of a protocol from the US Environmental Protection Agency where they were using broadband tungsten lamps. The measurement of 816 nanometers is much, much better. Can you imagine what the problem with a tungsten lamp would be in terms of reproducibility? Well, tungsten lamps give you a broadband output. Um, so the scattering that you're measuring is scattering from many, many different wavelengths all combined. And um, these instruments uh, fell into disrepute because people had different instruments from different manufacturers and they all gave different answers basically because the output of the tungsten lamps was varying from lamp to lamp, but also because the particles that you look at, um, if you're measuring from 400 to 700 nanometers, the absorption properties will also be playing a role in the measurement. So the measurement at 860 nanometers is much, much better because particulate absorption is much weaker at 860 nanometers, which you all know because someone taught you that last week. So, um, when people talk about turbid waters, very turbid waters, it really depends what they're used to. I put up a table here of what could be a nice way of standardizing um, the terminology of moderately turbid, very turbid, extremely turbid. Um, I suggest as parameter total suspended matter in grams per meter cubed, but all of these parameters are very closely correlated. Um, Side scattering turbidity is very closely limited to mass concentration. Scattering, backscattering, all of these are very closely correlated. And you could def define different ranges for each of these parameters. These correlations are not um, invariant, so there's plenty of papers now that show how the mass specific optical properties can vary from. Uh, place to place as a function of particle size, particle composition. Uh, these are a couple of nice references on that. So there is second order variability, but to the first order, all of these scattering and reflectance parameters are very closely related. Uh, Secchi depth is, is a bit different because it's not linear related, but um, there, there's a strong correlation between these parameters. OK, so um, what does the reflectance spectra look like for as turbidity or total suspended matter concentration increases. This is a modelled uh, remote sensing reflectance spectrum, so water leaving radiance over downwelling irradiance, for concentration of one milligram per metre cubed. No, that's wrong. One gram per metre cubed. And this spectral range is sensitive to TSM concentration and can be used to estimate it. Um, for these clearer waters, the near infrared reflectance is zero, and as you learned this morning, uh, that means that you can use a black near infrared atmospheric correction uh, for those kind of waters. If you then increase the concentration to 10, it increases the reflectance from 450 to up to 900, and all of this range becomes uh, usable for TSM estimation. Because you now have a non-zero reflectance in the near infrared, you need to have a slightly more sophisticated atmospheric correction, something like a bright pixel correction. There's plenty of possibilities there. Or you can use a black SWIR atmospheric correction as introduced by, by Mengua in 2007 because the SWIR uh, water reflectance is almost negligible at those concentrations. If you then increase a bit further, um, I've, the, the model I'm using here is not so reliable very high reflectances, so I've masked that out a bit. But you see a, an increase in reflectance, um, in particularly in the red of the near infrared, and uh, here in part of the sphere. So at these kind of concentrations, it's good to use this range for suspended matter con concentration estimation. And you need to start thinking about 
a bright sphere atmospheric correction or moving even further into the longer wavelengths to do a, a black pixel atmospheric correction. And then if you go up to 1,000, um, the model I was using becomes quite unreliable most, over most of the spectrum. Um, but what you do get is an increase in the spending matter at 1,050 nanometers. And there's a nice paper by Lisbeth's colleague, Els Knapps, where we measured um, non-zero water reflectance at 1,020 in a very turbid estuary. So 30 years ago, people were saying that the near-infrared was, was black. Then people were saying that it's not black, it's bright. But the sphere is black. And now people are saying that even at 1,000, 50 nanometers, you need to start thinking about some water reflectance. Okay, where do you find turbid waters? Um, the clearer waters um, are typical of non-bloom oceanic waters, uh, moderately turbid between 1 and 10. This is um, perhaps a high biomass oceanic bloom, or a reasonably clear but shallow lake, or tidal seas, 20 to 50 meters, often you get uh, suspended matter concentration between 1 and 10. For very turbid waters, it's shallower tidal seas where you get more resuspension that you get the higher concentrations. Uh, some lakes, um, certainly many river plumes and estuaries. And then for the extremely turbid from 100 up to more than 1,000, this is the world's major river plumes and estuaries like the Amazon, the La Plata, the Yangtze, the Yellow, uh, Yellow River. And there's many uh, inland rivers uh, which have these extremely turbid um, waters. To give you an idea, a thousand, uh, spending matter of a thousand, this gives you an underwater visibility of less than a centimetre. Um, so it's quite uh, difficult to see underwater in such cases. Motivation for turbid waters. This is a, a map of Belgian waters. So uh, the Belgian coast, it's about 75 kilometres long. Um, it's very busy. There's a lot of human activity there. This was a resource use map made by my colleagues where they plotted various things which you can't read, but I'll read out a few of them. Um, there's installation of offshore wind farms. So there's wind farms in all of this area in Belgian waters. Uh, this is an anchorage point. There's an area where sand and gravel extraction is allowed for um, for reselling of sand and gravel to the construction industry. Um, there's a, a marine protected area here, close to the coast. Um, there's lots and lots of things happening which need to be managed by, um, by the government um, to say who can do what, where, and under what restrictions. And our job as scientists is to pro provide best available knowledge to them to, to make good decisions. So in terms of the human pressures and the in interests, um, in general, they're most intense in the coastal and estuarine and inland waters, many of which are turbid. Uh, for example, in Europe, there's the Water Framework Directive, which obliges countries to uh, monitor the quality of their waters and to improve it. You can have very high biomass harmful algae blooms, which affect um, fisheries and aquaculture. Sediment transport is very, very important in uh, Belgian waters particularly, where there's a lot of dredging, there's coastal constructions. Uh, and I'll show a few examples from that. You have riverine sediment plumes, you have fish larvae, uh, nursery and spawning, spawning grounds, coastal fisheries and aquaculture and tourism. So there's lots and lots of things happening in the coastal waters, which is why there's an interest in exploiting the satellite data there. Yes? Uh, do people use it to monitor activity of dredgers and things like this? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'll show you in a minute. Um, dredging. Okay. Um, the, the, the new thing here is high resolution. When I started giving this course four years ago, I think I didn't show this because I didn't have this kind of data available. Um, now it's very easy to get the Landsat 8 data. It's free of charge. It's easy to process it. And it gives you resolution down to 30 meters. So we started seeing things, a lot of things that we couldn't see in the MODIS and MERIS data because they were limited to 300 meters. At 30 meters, you can see a lot of new things, particularly relating to human activities in coastal waters. And this is an example of the port of Zeebrugge in Belgium. This is five kilometer scale. The port itself is about one and a half kilometers, two kilometers wide. And 
you can see a lot of things in this that we couldn't see before. Um, here there's a, I'll talk about that one in a minute. Um, here we have breakwaters. These are um, cross shore constructions to restrain sand on the beach and you can see the sediment transport around them. You can see uh, particles, suspended particles going to the port of Zeebrugge and if you, may, you look at the images for different tidal phases, you can see them coming in or going out. Um, dredging. This port needs to be dredged every day to make sure that there's sufficient water depth for the large vessels that need to use it. And the dredging is managed that um, there's an area here where they're allowed to uh, dispose of the dredged uh, particles. So um, here you can see a turbid ship wake. If you've got really good eyesight, um, you can see a black uh, patch there where the, the suspended matter has been disposed. Um, it's black because it's come from the port. Um, it's slightly anoxic. And you can even see the ship which is going back to the port of Zebra to get some more. So he spends his day doing this, taking particles here, dropping them here. So we can now see that activity and we can check that it's being done in a, in a legal way. Uh, in this case, this is, this is totally legal. Um, it's necessary for the economic functioning of the port and uh, we can see that this has been doing, doing properly with the satellite data. So with Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 with the high spatial resolution data, um, we can see much, get much more information about what's happening in and around ports, estuaries, dredging plumes, wind farms. I'll show you an example from a wind farm. So there's problems and advantages in the turbid waters. The chlorophyll retrieval by blue-green algorithms fails, and that's because there's absorption from algae particles and non-algae particles. And you'll do a whole computer exercise which will show you why that's the case. Uh, so in general, we would switch to near, near red. We would switch to red near infrared algorithms for chlorophyll retrieval, or go to multispectral algorithms. Secondly, the atmospheric correction is more difficult. Well, maybe it's not, but it certainly needs to be treated differently because the near infrared reflectance is not zero. So you need to have some turbid water algorithm. The good news is that the marine signal is also much is much stronger than it was in the atmosphere. So. Um, Perhaps the atmospheric correction isn't so difficult because the problem that Cedric showed right at the start of his presentation, that the, in open ocean waters, the water reflectance is so small compared to the top of the atmosphere, that's not necessarily the case in turbid waters. You can get a very strong marine signal compared to the atmospheric signal. You can see turbid waters more easily. This is an example from um, early Sentinel-3 Ulchi data. Um, this is Belgium. I hope you're starting to recognise Belgium and the port of Zeebrugge here, scale test tree. Um, this is about 80 kilometres, 100 kilometres maybe. There's some clouds here, there's some land here. Um, you can already see at this top of atmosphere RGB that there's blue waters here and greener waters here. Um, this is not necessarily algal particles. In fact, we know that it's mainly mineral particles. But it's very easy to see. You fly over it in an aircraft, you can see that there's turbid waters here. What I've done is I've taken three locations in this image and I've plotted the top of atmosphere reflectance. And in the bluer waters, you get this, this quite smooth uh, decreasing signal from 400 to 900. Um, I guess you all recognize that now as being mainly the Rayleigh scattering in the atmosphere, which, which is very much stronger in the blue than in the near infrared. Um, so you've got this Rayleigh scattering in the atmosphere. You've also got an aerosol scattering on top of that, which is fairly white. So this is more or less the aerosol reflectance. You add on top of that the Rayleigh scattering. The water reflectance you can't see very clearly until you process it much, much further. That's from the blue point. If you look at the green point, it's pretty much the same atmosphere that we're looking at. So we can assume that the atmosphere is, signal is similar in all three cases. But what we have is quite a different, um, much higher reflectance in the green. Why is it higher in the green? You have to answer the question, otherwise we can't go on. Uh, ah, um, well, from, from this plot you can't tell. 
it could be chlorophyll or it could be mineral particles. Um, we happen to know it's mineral particles, but if you don't know the region, chlorophyll particles is, is a good guess. It's particles anyway. Uh, it's suspended particles in the water that are scattering light um, well, throughout the spectrum, but the spectral peak would be green. And if you think of the difference between this spectrum and this spectrum, that's more or less the uh, green reflectance here. OK, there is a small green reflectance here from the water as well, but it's, it's giving you a good idea of what the reflectance is here. And then if you go closer to the coast, where the water looks a bit browner, you get this much higher reflectance again. And you can see that if you can compare this one with this one, we're in a situation where we have maybe 75% of the signal is coming from the water, even at 705 nanometers. So um, it's quite different from the situation where we had in, cl in clear waters. In these turbid waters, the strongest signal at the top of the atmosphere can be from the water, even in the near infrared. OK, this is one, another, one advantage of the turbid waters. It's something we could do with in turbid waters that wasn't possible in clear waters. Um, it's an activity we had a few years ago to use a meteorological sensor called Severi. It's a very noisy sensor, um, very poor spectral resolution. No one thought it would work. But because we have this very strong signal from the turbid waters, even with this very crude sensor, it was possible to pick up information from the water. So what I'm going to show is um, an animation. This is Belgium. Um, here, there's going to be a time series of turbidity at this point. And here, there's going to be a time series of turbidity at this point in the North Sea, where colleagues from the UK have these um, optical backscatter sensors in the water. And on the left, it's Severi for a day. On the right, it's Modus. So um, at the beginning, we have just in situ data. Then we get the Severi data coming in. This is a map of turbidity every 15 minutes. Here's the time scale. Modus comes in at 12.30 and then goes away again. What you see here is not a surprise to the sediment transport people. They knew this was happening. But for ocean color people, it can be a bit disturbing because we were used to getting this one image per day from MODIS. But as you can see, there's all this tidal variability associated with resuspension of sediments and horizontal evection, particularly resuspension in this case. And Severi, the geostationary sensor, is picking this up quite nicely, following the in-situ data. MODIS is giving you one image per day, which is actually not representative of everything that was happening in that region on that day. So this is the analysis over the whole day. Um, this is the average we made of the Severi images. So we had th 34 images on that day. We had a picture which was almost cloud-free at some time during the day. And from MODIS, at the time MODIS went over, it was 60% cloudy. So it's quite frustrating here on that day that we had no um, information from Belgian waters. And this showed clearly the advantage of the, the geostationary method for um, remote sensing of areas where there's either tidal variability or scattered clouds. OK, I'll move on to chlorophyll retrieval now. I think last week you looked at IOP inversion techniques. Um, that will be useful. I'm not going to talk so much about IOPs. I'm going to talk about more about chlorophyll. Um, starting off historically with the case one water al algorithms, which are based on blue-green ratio. Um, OK, this is a bit of a busy slide, but on the y-axis, it's the reflectance 490 divided by reflectance 555. And on the x-axis, it's the chlorophyll concentration in milligrams per meter cubed. And there's a set of uh, data from cruises and an empirical method which fits it quite well and gives very good performance in open oceans uh, for case one chlorophyll. Um, OK, there's, there's variance on these methods, but there's quite a good um, consensus now that this is the best way to do chlorophyll in open ocean waters. It's completely wrong in turbid waters. so. If you use these algorithms or use products based on these algorithms in turbid waters, you get data that's completely wrong. And you need to be very careful to recognize when that's happening. 
A second class of methods which is much more successful in turbid waters is using the absorption of phytoplankton at about 65 nanometers. Um, this is one example of two reflectance spectra for the same non-algae particle concentration, the same seed on absorption, but different chlorophyll um, concentrations, where there's almost no change in the reflectance spectrum, except here, where you get some extra absorption because of the chlorophyll A. So because of this feature, people have designed algorithms to look at, for example, a band ratio at 708 to 664 as a way of estimating chlorophyll in turbid waters. This is a, an example from Herman Gons. Um, and it's semi-empirical, but the numbers in there do correspond to uh, physical parameters that are recognizable, like the pure water absorption at the different wavelengths and the chlorophyll-specific phytoplankton absorption at 664 nanometers. So these are reasonably successful, and you'll be um, exploring that later in the Excel exercise. Um, in this respect, the 709 band on Meris and Olchi um, is very useful for coastal water chlorophyll, more useful than the MODIS 4, 748 band, which is a little too far away from the, the chlorophyll absorption feature to, to be a good normalization band. Okay, and then a third family of methods is multispectral fitting, where you use all the wavelengths and you have some kind of forward model and an inversion technique like a neural network to automatically fit the measured spectrum with a forward model spectrum to give you an estimate of the chlorophyll. Uh, this could be the best approach for global processing for all waters. Um, there's still some uh, discussions in the community about the best way to go. Um, but these methods also have potential problems with multiple solutions, and you'll see an example of that later. And uh, sometimes they're given an, an, an answer, but it's, it's not easy to understand the physics um, behind it and whether there's something uh, wrong with the sensor calibration, for example, or, or with the data in general. Uh, there are natural limits to all of these methods. So there's cases where phytoplankton is not sufficiently uh, present. Uh, chlorophyll A concentration is not sufficiently high that it actually affects the color of the waters. So in high non-algae particle waters or high sedon waters, there is a detection limit for chlorophyll, below which you can't tell the difference. Okay, some typical problems in turbid waters. This is an example from um, Meris third reprocessing. This is fixed now, but this is something that was happening for a, a year or two that we got the data from Meris. And in the top, it's a time series in Belgian waters of chlorophyll and total suspended matter just below it. It's a time series over 10 years from Meris. And what we saw in the data, which we hadn't found in the matchups, is that we were getting these huge chlorophyll blooms in winter. So chlorophyll of 30 to 50 in December, which, which just doesn't happen in, in Belgium. Um, we get spring blooms of that magnitude, but not winter blooms. Um, it was clearly correlated to the high TSM that does exist in winter because of stronger winds and re <coughs> resuspension. So, it became pretty clear that this was a case where uh, the turbidity in the water was creating a problem with the chlorophyll retrieval algorithm that had got through the first quality control checks. So that's now been fixed. Um, this was the previous reprocessing where you get something that's much more uh, realistic for our region where you get these spring blooms uh, but no winter blooms. So this is not unusual and this still happens in many stand-up products from many satellite um, missions. Okay, if we go beyond chlorophyll, there's an interest in things like phytoplankton functional types. Um, when we start, started giving the chlorophyll maps to marine biologists and water quality managers 10 years ago, they, they thought that's really, really great. But then they started asking, well, we want to know whether it's phytocystis or diatoms. We want to know the, the size class of the phytoplankton. They asked lots of difficult questions. Um, they wanted to know whether the algae was harmful or harmless, because that was important for aquaculture and fisheries. And with just chlorophyll on its own, you can't, you can't make that kind of judgment. So there's a strong interest in going beyond just chlorophyll. 
interpret water's chlorophyll is already quite difficult, and species identification is not impossible, not possible in general, but in this, there are specific cases where it can become possible, particularly when it's high biomass or has distinctive IUPs. And I'll show a couple of examples, two examples of Belgian waters where um, detection of Dr. Lucas Sinterlands is possible. This is heterotrophic dinoflagellate. It's not, um, it's not phytoplankton, but it's, it's plankton. And Physis globosa. But you can also have algorithms for detecting coccolithophores, carinia, um, and there's a whole IOCCG report on phytoplankton functional types. However, in this report, it's a 156-page report, but there's only about half a page on case two waters because it was considered to be really rather difficult to go further than chlorophyll at the time. So there's, there's plenty to do still, and uh, maybe some of you guys are going to take it further in the next five to ten years. This is an example of detection of physis globosa in turbid waters. So uh, this is a post to, uh, paper by Rosa Astraica where she measured the absorption coefficient of physis and diatoms. Physis is the dark one, diatoms is the lighter line. This was measured in laboratory cultures but also on in situ samples. Under the microscope, they look very, very different, but the absorption spectrum is really rather similar. And um, the only big difference we could find is, is here, at 467 nanometers, which is related to chlorophyll C3. And um, if we zoom in on that area, uh, we can see that the diatom absorption spectrum is quite smooth, but the fire absorption spectrum has this little peak at 467 because of the extra pigment. We then, so we developed an absorption based algorithm to pick up chlorophyll C3 and converted that into a reflectance based algorithm. Okay, um, and in the paper, you can see reflectance spectra which have this li a little minimum associated with this maximum in absorption. But it's a small effect and it's very difficult to pick it up in the turbid waters because of all the non-algae particles that are absorbing as well. Hey Kevin, does this biocystis form colonies? Yep. So is this individual or is it the colony? The oh, good question, yeah. Uh, it depends what instrument you're using to measure it. Um, um, yep, so physistus, this is a microscopic photo, 50 micrometer scale. And each of these little dots is a cell. And they're all stuck together with a uh, a mucus uh, that, that makes them much, much bigger. It makes them into a colony, which is thought to be a protection against predators because it tastes really bad and it's really quite large. This is a typical diatom chain at a different magnification. I don't have the magnification on that. Um, so it does make a difference how you measure the absorption on this because if you pump it, then you're likely to break up all the uh, break up the colony into individual cells. Uh, whereas if you measure it in situ without a pump, then you can preserve the colony structure. Um, in practice, for the absorption spectrum, it doesn't make much difference because the mucus doesn't seem to be absorbing very much. Um, we also looked at scattering. For scattering, it can make a difference whether they're stuck together in a colony or whether they're free cells. Yeah. Is there gas vacuoles? Uh, I think not. Um, they are tricky to measure in a different, for a number of reasons. If you, if you filter the water sample, um, then it becomes quite difficult to measure because you because the mucus is so sticky that you can get stuff in the filter. You can get um, water in the filter, which you can't dry out. You can get, I guess you could get air, air bubbles as well stuck in there. Um, it makes more difference for scattering than for absorption. Yeah. Okay. And then another, the other example is Noctilucus sintilans. This is, um, it's, uh, here it's brown. Uh, first time I saw it from a ship, it was red and I, checked the, with the, the ship uh, cook that he wasn't sending out tomato soup or something when we were trying to make our measurements because it really looked like tomato soup. Um, it's a 
Heterotrophic dinoflagellate, it bioluminesces at night, it's really, really pretty. And you get it in very, very strong con concentrations in Belgian waters in about June, when it's hot and when it's calm, it rises to the surface. Um, it's nice optically because it's a very strong signal. So we had various measurements where these spectra are various measurements in water without noctiluca, turbid water, clear water, biosynthesis blooms, uh, whatever. And all the measurements we made in the noctiluca blooms had this very high red and near infrared reflectance and a sharp increase from here. So even in turbid waters, it is possible to detect some, some plankton species, but in general, it's much more challenging than in the open ocean. Okay, I think we'll move on to suspended matter. Um, there's different words for this. I'm going to use the, wor the words total suspended matter. Um, it's the mass of particles on a filter um, that you've rinsed properly to get the salt out of it per unit volume. Um, other words that are used for this are suspended particulate matter concentration or total suspended solids. Um, and you see different acronyms used in different places, but it's often the same base parameter that we're talking about. There, there are other parameters where this is split up into organic and inorganic fractions or algae and non-algae fractions, but um, I'm going to be talking about total suspended matter, which is all of the particles together, their mass. So it's generally easier than chlorophyll in turbid waters because the signal is so strong, and you can see it from top of atmosphere. This is a Meris image. This is the Bel Belgium here. This is the UK, Netherlands, France. And this is, this is a pretty difficult image for um, processing because you can see all this white stuff. Uh, this is cirrus clouds, thin haze. There's some contrails, which are focusing on the airports. Um, you'd expect this to be really, really difficult to, to exploit. But even in these difficult um, conditions, you can see the green waters behind the haze and the clouds. Because the turbid water has such a strong signal. So it's not always difficult. Um, OK, some equations on this one. Um, from a, a paper for retrieval of TSM, uh, where we used uh, a simplified Gordon Morel reflectance model. So the reflectance is here, backscatter BB absorption. This is a, it's not a constant, but it groups together many effects that don't vary too much. And you can decompose the absorption into non-particular non absorption. So this is water plus CDOM. This is the particles, and the star means it's mass specific, and S is the suspended particulate matter concentration. You can do something similar for backscatter, but you can say that it's just proportional to concentration. The mass is not very difficult. You get a suspended matter algorithm which is a function of reflectance, which is itself a function of wavelength, and there's two calibration parameters. I'll show you what that actually looks like. So the remote sensing reflectance at any single wavelength is almost linearly related to the total suspended matter concentration. Um, here we've got suspended matter concentration on the x-axis, remote sensing reflectance on the y-axis. The different colors are the different wavelengths. And if you take, um, for example, 865 nanometers, this is almost a straight line. That's because the denominator here is, goes to 1. This, this is small compared to that. And you get basically that suspended matter is proportional to reflectance. This is quite easy to understand. If you've got, uh, if you put more and more particles in, then they're going to backscatter more and more light, and you're going to increase the reflectance. Um, What's, what makes it really easy is that it's, it's almost a linear relationship. When you get to higher reflectances, uh, that does tail off. There's some kind of asymptote because there's a physical limit. You can't get infinite reflectance. So you can't get more light coming back up than you, had putting, than you put in going down. So um, there, there's going to be some limit somewhere of a maximum reflectance. And according to this model, um, it's quite a simple as in to as reflectance approaches the calibration parameters C. What's nice is that you have a different, okay, you have, you have the same model that applies at each wavelength, but 
each wavelength has a different sensitivity to different concentrations. So um, if, you're, if you're at a low reflectance, then you're getting quite a weak signal from the water. And you may be in difficulty with sensor noise. So often your, sensor, your satellite will have a certain amount of noise on it. And it will be difficult to measure accurately the low reflectances. You then have a regime in the middle where you have a moderate reflectance that's probably much higher than your sensor noise um, and where you have quite a linear response. And then for the highest reflectances, you have this, we call it the saturation regime, where you have less and less sensitivity to increasing suspended matter. So um, one of the popular ideas now is that you can estimate suspended matter using a single wavelength, but you change the wavelength as your concentration increases. So if you're trying to measure at 150 milligrams per litre, then you should be using 865 nanometers because 620 nanometers is not very sensitive. Whereas if you're measuring 10 milligrams per litre, then you don't want to measure at 865 because you're going to have a very noisy signal. It would be much better measuring at, say, 665 or 620. So that was single band algorithm for TSM. Um, you can also use band differences. This was an example where um, this was very turbid waters of the La Plata. And in this algorithm, with this algorithm, uh, we wanted to avoid the aerosol correction because the aerosol correction can be quite difficult. And it's not so important, uh, unless you do it really, really badly, in which case it's very important. Um, if you take the, the difference of reflectance 858, 1240, this is modus bands. Then this is the reflectance difference of those two bands. This is how that relates to turbidity. And as long as you're up to 1,000 turbidity, about 1,000 grams per meter cubed, then you have quite a, a nice relationship between the two. What's useful about the band differences is that um, if you have white aerosols, then this removes them almost automatically, so you don't need to worry about the aerosol correction. Uh, and that was applied here. This is um, the Plata Estuary, 300 kilometers. This is Argentina, this is Uruguay. Uh, these are very turbid waters. Um, I guess Wancho presented these at some time, or? OK. He's got some photos. Um, this is the turbidity map we made out of it, where turbidity goes up to about 500 in this um, region where the estuarine waters meets the offshore waters. And this was done with a, a band difference algorithm. Yep? Why the turbidity, turbidity is higher in that place? Um, yeah, good question. Are you going to answer that or shall I answer that? Um, probably, yeah. So uh, this is the estuarine water. This is much saltier. Um, Offshore water. I think this, the salinity here is about one. Salinity here is about 34. And it, where they meet, then everything falls, I think. Does that make sense? It's a process where, this, where the water gets more salty and this, things are coalescing and precipitating. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's flocculation. Particles get bigger, they fall down. And there's also low bathymetry and a lot of uh, wave uh, interaction yeah. with, with the water. But it could be that the, the shallow water there, the bathymetry, is caused is a result of the fluctuation rather than yeah. than causing the. I don't know. It could be both, but yeah. It's more mm. But the color you're observing is that because it's obviously shallow, or it's because it's very turbid. So even though it's milky brown. Um, the color of the water. I got a, I should have a picture of that somewhere. It's not milky brown, I would say it's brown. Um, I, I don't know if you get the colors properly on this, but it is pretty brown. It's brown. Um, and then a third class of algorithms um, by David Doxerin started these, uh, looking at band ratios. For example, band ratio of 865 reflectance over 555 reflectance as a function of suspended matter. Again, a strong relationship, uh, monotonic function of SPM and um, this can be used quite effectively as well. Multispectral fitting, as for chlorophyll, the multispectral fitting can be quite successful and you're going to do that yourselves. Um, 
This is the base parameter, suspended matter concentration, but again, the sedimentologists and the biologists wanted us to give us, wanted more information than that. Sediment transport people are very interested in particle size distribution because it affects um, the settling rate. Um, they're interested in organic fraction or carbon content for different reasons. So these are the things that people are trying to develop algorithms for at the moment. There's plenty of research to do um, to go beyond suspended matter concentration. Um, and for example, there's some promising ideas to look at the backscatter spectral slope, which is a function of particle size distribution, um, absorption backscatter ratios. Um, if you have a multi-look sensor, you can start thinking about probing um, the water at different angles, and perhaps you'll find, you'll get some information on the angular var variation of scattering of the particles in the water, or perhaps you'll just get information on the BRDF of the atmosphere. Um, and then polarization might be a way of getting more information. So um, it's quite easy to get the concentration, but it's going to be a challenge to get more than just concentration. And there's many ideas that are being um, considered, particularly sp more spectral information, to try and find out more about these particles. Underwater visibility. Um, so in addition to chlorophyll spend matter concentration, underwater visibility is of interest for a number of applications, particularly diving. Can you see this guy? Yeah, you can't see his, his, his neck or his shoulders uh, because he's working in, visible, in waters with visibility of less than a centimetre. And the news report said that specialist divers were battling strong tides and zero visibility to construct, uh, or to cover an underwater pipeline. Um, and we receive requests occasionally for visibility protections for diving operations. They say, well, um, if we go out diving tomorrow, what time of day is best to go? When is it maximum visibility, minimum turbidity? Or is it not even worth going because we're not going to see anything? So there's a few applications coming in there. And it's not just humans, it's the animals as well. It's important for the underwater, uh, the habitat for some animals. Um, going back to that case of La Plata, the fisheries scientists were interested because um, if, if you're a fish larvae which has predators which hunt visually, then this is a great place to be because there's visibility of less than one centimetre. So it's like living inside a cloud. No one can see you. They're not going to eat you. On the other hand, if you're a visual predator yourself, then this is a really bad place to see because you can't see anything. So you're going to go to a different part of the estuary or to offshore waters to, to find food. Um, OK, visual predation is not the only mechanism for finding food. There's also smell and uh, other, other processes. But the underwater light climate is important for many marine animals in terms of finding food or not being eaten. And there's a, there's a paper by some fish biologists who, dis, who um, looked at the rhodopsin gene in sand gobies. This affects the spectral response function of the fish eye. And they suggested that um, fish in different regions were genetically adapting to have a better spectral response function to pick up, so they had better visibility for the light where they, where they lived. So it's important. OK. Um, historically, the focus has been, of ocean color has been oceanic chlorophyll. And uh, the Modus Meris Ulchi missions, I think they still do not have turbid water transparency type products. They just have case one KD490. Although we are seeing users that want to have things like euphotic depth, power attenuation for what that's worth, horizontal visibility. Um, the water quality managers, some of them even ask for secchi depth. OK, we think it's not the greatest optical parameter around, but if they're asking for it, then um, it's, we'll try and give it to them. And we'll try and give them something else at the same time that we think is is more relevant uh, optically, but um, this is, these are parameters that are really used and that people want to get from satellite data. Okay, so to conclude. Chlorophyll problems in turbid waters are because of non-algae particle absorption. The solution is to use red near infrared algorithms or multispectral algorithms. TSM retrieval in turbid waters is easy. Um, it's easy, it's a strong signal. You can use single band algorithms if you want to. 
and you can increase the wavelength for increasing suspended matter to, to get the best um, compromise between signal noise and lack of saturation. Transparency and diffuse attenuation coefficient algorithms for turbid waters, they're emerging. Um, there's nothing particularly difficult to do, they just need to be developed. And what we're going to do next is a computer exercise on the color of turbid water to consolidate some of the stuff that I've been talking about here and what you did last week. Um, then after the break, you're going to look at Landsat 8 and the Central 2 imagery from around the world. And then you're going to present it tomorrow. And then tomorrow we'll have a final lecture on applications and future perspectives. I think that's the end. OK. Are there any questions on this so far? Yeah? I was just curious with the limits to the TSM. So in your algorithms, like in winter, you, you presumably, even though it's not a, as much light, you can't see as much TSM. Uh, you're thinking about the, the, the low sun? Low sun conditions, or when you say in winter? Oh, like the, the threshold for seeing chlorophyll in turbid waters and things like that. It's just interesting to think that there's a seasonality, right? So. Okay, um, seasonality. Okay, you've got seasonality of chlorophyll uh, in nearly all coastal waters, except maybe the tropics. You've got seasonality of suspended matter in many regions. You can have tidal effects. In Belgian waters, we have a lot of wind-driven uh, seasonality as well. Um, you know, with the curves, when you, you saturate, essentially. Okay. I just think it's interesting to think that it could have a seasonal saturation. Um, yeah. Uh, I would not go the way of... Okay, the performance of an algorithm... I would say that the performance of the algorithm depends on um, whether you're in this reflectance uh, range and what wavelength you're using. That in turn de de depends, the, the, the concentration that you're trying to measure in turn depends on seasonality in a way that's potentially very complex. But I would take that seasonality discussion out of the algorithm performance question because the algorithm performance can be very directly related to where you are on this graph. And you could uh, you can quite easily make an uncertainty estimate. For example, if from your atmospheric correction you can estimate the uncertainty on the remote sensing reflectance, so an uncertainty here, you can then, and if you're using this wavelength, you can then easily relate that to an uncertainty on the suspended matter retrieval. But in fact, it's much easier than it is with many chlorophyll algorithms, for example. It's a, it's a simple transfer function. And obviously, if you have a, an error on your remote sensing reflectance here of the same magnitude, if you think of varying the reflectance here, you're then going to have a huge uh, uncertainty on the suspended matter concentration. So it's, it's quite easy to see from this, this graph. Any other questions or comments? Yeah? I think most of the concepts are maybe uh, I'm wrong, I'm not getting um, when you're looking at the turbidity at surface, mm -hmm. the turbidity depends on, on the mixing depth. You know? So, I mean, if you're mixing deeper, then your concentration will fall, right? Okay, so it's a good point that what we see with the satellites is only what you can see from above water. So, um, the satellite-derived signal will only be from the first few centimetres or the first few metres. And the actual depth depends on the wavelength that you're using and on the suspended matter concentration. And that's all you can see. So when you show a satellite suspended matter image, it's the same with chlorophyll. It's just the surface concentration. And what you mean by surface could be defined in an extra plot. It could be defined. Uh, you could define what the surface depth means in your chlorophyll image or your suspended matter image. Um, it might be possible to do more than that because, okay, Cedric, I think, mentioned the LIDAR systems where with a sufficiently powerful laser, you could penetrate further than you can with sunlight. So you could measure suspended matter at 
depth that you can't see with a, with a passive uh, remote sensing approach. Um, that's one method for going deeper. A second method for going deeper might be to look at the concentration for different wavelengths because at 865 nanometers, you're never going to see more than the top meter. Whereas at 620 nanometers, you could potentially see the top five meters. So um, it might be possible to say something about the vertical variation of suspended matter concentration by probing the ocean at different wavelengths. I, I don't know of any successful cases of that yet, but it's potentially feasible. Um, and then thirdly, a more typical thing to do is just give your satellite maps to the modelers, and then the modelers have some kind of sediment transport model which would give you information on the, the water uh, the, on the vertical profile. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, uh, it's important to note that limitation that we're talking about surface or near surface. I mean, it happens, as for chlorophyll, it happens that if you're mixing that, it's changing your concentration. Yes, That's yeah. The it's exactly the same situation, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm just going to demonstrate it in five minutes now because I don't have the time to give a fuller session with you. But um, in this five minute demonstration, you'll get an idea of how it works, and then you can go through the exercises by yourself. So um, I think one shows distributed the Excel, or he's put it on Dotbox or something. Um, this is what it looks like. You need to accept the uh, macro security. So um, hopefully, your system managers will allow you to do that. You might need to rescale the screen so that you can see everything properly. So what it is, it's, um, it's a simple Excel-based model, um, which takes, you, you can look at all the calculations here. Um, you have three inputs. The inputs are chlorophyll A concentration, non-algae particle concentration, and CDOM absorption coefficient. And you can vary these. What's nice about the model, actually the only thing that's nice about it, is that you can change these interactively and see how this changes your backscatter and your absorption. So, um, for example, here I've increased non-algae particle concentration from 0.01 to 10. And as I did that, you could see how the backscatter coefficient changes. Um, I'll do that again. So if you press this button, everything goes back down to nearly zero. And you have, um, here you have the backscatter coefficient of each component. So green is phytoplankton, orange is water, and blue is non-algae particle. The, the black line is the sum of everything, so it's total backscatter. Similarly here, the absorption coefficients, you have the four components, and you have the total, which is A. In this case, you can only see one line because it's pure water absorption. Everything else is set to very low concentrations. And then here you get the remote sensing reflectance that results from those, that backscatter and absorption um, choice. So if you have very low concentrations of everything, you have basically a pure water absorption coefficient and a, a very small backscatter coefficient with a, some spectral variation. And you get a reflectance spectrum. And the color of this water is? What's the color of this water? Blue. It's blue, or it's even violet. It's really very blue peaked. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. Um, I'll save that spectrum so you can compare with it. It's going to appear in orange in a minute. Now I'm going to increase the non algae particles. So as I do that, you can see that the backscatter increases here. Total backscatter increases a bit. Absorption coefficient doesn't change very much because we're still at quite low particle concentrations where it's pure water absorption that's dominating. And the reflectance spectrum changes a bit. I'll increase it more, up to 10 now. The backscatter coefficient has increased significantly. The absorption, uh, total absorption is now higher in the blue than in the green. So if I take it down and up again, you'll see if you look here, this is decreasing part non-algae particle absorption. This is increasing it again. It makes a change essentially here. And as you do that, the reflectance spectrum changes dramatically. Um, you get an increase in reflectance throughout the green, red, near infrared. Um, and you get a small decrease of reflectance of 400. Why would the reflectance decrease at 400? 
absorption, yeah. It's because you're increasing absorption. You haven't changed the backscatter. Well, you do change the backscatter as you add particles, but you change the absorption faster than you change the backscatter, so the reflectance goes down. And then um, in the exercises, one of the important exercises actually is, is to look at this kind of situation. So this is chlorophyll 1, non-algae particle of 10. I haven't put any sedum on, but you can add sedum. And this is the reflectance spectrum you, you get. Um, now, if you increase the chlorophyll A concentration from 1 to 10, I'll take that down again. This is 1. This is 10. And the remote sensing reflectance spectrum doesn't change very much. Um, it did increase a bit. Uh, it did, uh, well, sorry, it, it decreased a bit as you went from 1 to 10. Decreased a bit here. But the impact of changing chlorophyll from 1 to 10 is not, is not so great. Um, and this is why it's difficult to estimate chlorophyll A in turbid waters. It's because it doesn't have that much impact on the reflectance spectrum. And that's because it didn't have much, it had a negligible effect on the backscatter. Um, it did have a small effect on the total absorption. Um, situation gets much worse if you have even higher concentrations. So if we take non-algae particles up to 100, which happens in estuaries, I'll resave that. If you now increase chlorophyll from 10 to 30, you see almost no change in the reflectance spectrum in the blue-green, which is why the blue-green algorithms fail. What you do get is some uh, red chlorophyll absorption at 665 nanometers, which is why the red near-infrared algorithms still may function for very high non-algae particle concentration with very high chlorophyll. So in, in the computer exercise, which I invite you to do this evening, um, there's all games to play where you have different spectra here and you have to play with these inputs until you fit it properly. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do the red one for you. So when I see the red spectrum, I see I have a high near-infrared reflectance. Immediately that says that you need to have lots of non-algae particles. So we, we click on this until we, get, until we get a match here. OK, so we're, we've matched the near-infrared reflectance spectrum by increasing non-algae particles. In the blue, green, red, we don't have a perfect match. So the next thing to do would be to add CDOM. What happens, when, what happens to the reflectance spectrum if we add CDOM? Yeah, it goes down. Yeah. And does it go down at all wavelengths in the same way? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it goes down, particularly in the blue. So if we look at the absorption coefficient, this is, a, this is increasing with CDOM. And the reflectance spectrum is decreasing. So if we're trying to fit the red, uh, the, the brown spectrum, what we've done is first fit the near infrared with, by increasing non-algae particles. Then we fitted the, the blue by increasing CDOM. And we've got something which is fitting pretty well there and there, but not fitting there. So what do we do to get to fit there? We increase chlorophyll. So we increase chlorophyll from 0.01 to 0.1 and you see no difference. You increase it to, to 1, and you see almost no difference. If you increase it to 12, then you can fit the brown one. And if you increase it to 19, you can fit the red one. Um, OK, I've been through that very quickly. If you go through the exercises in the way I've written them, then you get more of an understanding of how the full spectrum depends on each th of these three coefficients, uh, each of these constituents. And you also get an idea of what happens when, um, when you don't have all those spectral bands to play with. If you only have, and this is, this is one of the most interesting bits of the exercise, I think. If you only have multispectral data, say the six, sorry, the seven CWIS, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
Okay, that's one too many. Uh, but that's the C wristbands. If you don't have the hyperspectral input, then you'll find many different combinations of chlorophyll and non algae particles that will fit the spectrum in, the, in exactly the same way. This actually happens um, with things like the neural network algorithms where you can get multiple solutions which fit the data equally well. So um, if you do the computer exercise, you'll realize that more clearly and you'll begin to understand some of the difficulties in inverting uh, the spectra in turbid waters, um, particularly if you don't have enough spectral data or if you have some noise or atmospheric correction errors, then that will also make it more difficult to fit. I think I'm going to stop talking there. Um, in the lecture notes, there's brief lectures to, under, to explain what the, how the model works. And in the computer exercise, if you go through it, then um, you get the answers at the back as well. So if you're struggling, you can go to the answers. And I'll be happy to, if you have any problems uh, running it, I'll be happy to talk to you tomorrow in the coffee breaks. Um, if, you, if you do the exercise and get stuck somewhere, then please come and to me in a coffee break and I'll try and explain further.